GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Good morning, Guam, and thanks for starting your day the KUAM way. We're just jump right into it, uh, discussing decolonization. Uh, of course, with the Commission on Decolonization's Executive Director, Melvin uh, Wampat Borja. So, um, interesting topic today. Admittedly, I don't know um, much about transitioning. And this is, um, I think, a good subject because a lot of people have questions about, okay, so after the uh, we decide what political status we want and then um, we start transitioning to that, how does it work? So, yeah, I guess, it. and we have examples that we can oh, absolutely. look at. I th and that's one of the, I think, one of the benefits of us being kind of behind the rest of the world in a sense is that we get an opportunity to really learn about the experience of other nations, right. you know, what really worked for them, what didn't, what were their challenges, where were they successful. But I think that's definitely one of the biggest misconceptions about decolonization is, is the transitional period, you know, right. which is kind of like this mystery to a lot of people. I think Some a lot people, of people uh, think that. Uh, we choose a status, wake up tomorrow, and we're a right. state or we're independent. Right. That's, that's not the case, right? Right, and especially with a, a status that is kind of uh, to to an extreme for a lot of people, like independence or statehood, right? Is like there's a drastic shift in the way that we're going to do things. And so I think that's something that makes people very uneasy, you know, is are we going to be prepared for this change, this shift? And I think that that's the thing that a lot of people need to recognize and realize is that the, the process of decolonization is not an overnight process. You know, it's, it's going to take a while. And so when we decide what our political status will be when we determine that, and we, we will have to negotiate that. Ultimately, no matter what status we choose, be it statehood, free association, independence, any of those statuses has to be negotiated with the federal government. And so in that negotiation, we will not only decide how it's what it's going to look like but when it will start to change and how we will get from point a to point b right and so for example i'm just sorry to interrupt but i just no. want to i mean do you agree that when we negotiate these statuses with the federal government like there's no cookie cutter statehood or cookie cutter in the no there's so we not can, we can pick and choose absolutely things that are beneficial to us. right because in even in the history of the admission of uh members into the union, right, uh, places that have become states like Hawaii and Alaska, the newly, the most recent uh, admissions into the union, there are different negotiations in how that process was going to work. And so n no state mirrors another. And uh, there are certain things that are kind of like the baseline, you know, in terms of like representation, right. the upper lower house, representation in the uh, electoral college and whatnot, but in the, in the sense that uh, how things work within the state borders, you know, every state is different. Every state yeah. has their own constitution, their own laws that, that govern them. And so we would do the same thing. You know, if we were to become a state, we would have to negotiate, you know, what that's going to look like outside of the baseline. And the same thing goes with a freely associated relationship or an independent relationship. No matter the status, we have to determine, you know, we know, we will know, okay, this is where we want to be but how do we get there? And right. so we have to establish a period of time where we're gonna transition. So, so for example, with the Philippines, they actually, before uh, they were a US territory, a lot like us, and then they became an independent country. But they didn't just become an independent country overnight. There was a 10 year period where they had, a, uh, it was known as their Commonwealth area, where they basically were under a Commonwealth uh, model of government that was still administered by the United States, but it was done in a way where they understood, okay, at, at this at the end of this era we are going to relinquish all of our control to the philippine government and then they will become independent now that transition was 10 years now keep in mind that the transition was interrupted by a period of war and so and that was one of the criticisms of the commonwealth era for the right. philippines was so that we're, we're talking now this is like what would you say again 1938 to okay. 40 so interrupted by world war ii yeah so right and so with, with that interruption, it, it obviously lessened the, uh, or it, it complicated the transition. And so there was not- That's putting it mildly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and there was not enough time for the, that was one of the criticisms, was that the Philippine government didn't have enough time to, to give a, a real transitional effort into becoming an independent nation. Right. But that being said, I think that there are still a lot of really great things that the Philippines uh, did during that transitional period. For example, uh, uh, Quezon, right, he, one of the things he instituted was this thing called Kina. It was basically like uh, uh, the key to economic nationalism. 
which I think is really uh, understated for in a lot of our history is that, you know, when we look at the Philippines now, I mean, just in our everyday lives, like how many people say, oh, oh we got a basketball team coming up, we're going to go order our uniforms in the Philippines, you know, or we got a wedding, we're going to go, you know, make the party favors and order it from the Philippines. Is because, and that's only possible because of the government's investment in industry. So during this, this Kina concept in 1938, basically what the government was trying to do was to, to, to really urge the citizens to, um, to create products in-house right. and to invest in those industries. And so, you know, that, and that was all in preparation to build the economy, right, to make it uh, a powerhouse so that it can survive. Uh, now, th it, I think that the concept is right, and that's something that we would we would want to do no matter what right. political status we choose. Even if we become a state model, we should develop our economy. We talked about that before, um, and and what I think is and we really, shouldn't have we should wait till that transition period. We shouldn't. I mean, there's and, a lot of things right. that we could. I there mean, are a the lot of things we can't do. Being colonized. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you know, I think that that's one of the things that we we can kind of predict. You know, is like with the Philippines and even with a, a model like Palau, it's right. a freely associated model. Both of them struggled with uh, with the economic development and social development prior to the change in political status. And so we already know that that's something that we should be looking at, and that's something that I think we because we're you know we are behind the rest of the world in this process. It gives us that advantage in the sense that w when we go to the table to negotiate with the federal government, we should be mindful of the challenges of places like the Philippines and Palau. So but we can also take the good things that. Oh, absolutely! They did the, right. Hey, let's take this good thing from the Philippines. Let's do this one from Palau. Let's take this. One right, from and but I think that that's something that's something that we need to really take note of is is how can we learn from that? What did they invest into their economy or into their government that was successful, and what are the things that kind of fell short? We know that the investment in their, in their home base industry was positive, but we also know that there was not enough of that going on, you know, and so the, and there was not enough social development. You know, th that was one of the things that, I mean, obviously the disparity between the rich and the poor in, in the Philippines is a, is a very big problem, but there are certain things that, that can be, that could have been developed prior to that transition that would have eased it. Um, and I think that a lot of people in the Philippines would agree that more time to transition would have been beneficial. And so that's something that I think that we, you know, we realistically, we can negotiate that. Mm -hmm. We don't have to say, you know, it doesn't have to be a 10 year period. It could be right. a 15, 20 year period. It's really up to us. And I think that that's something that we have to figure out. That's one of the things that I think is important about us looking at economic and social development now is, you know, what are the things that we can do now and what are our limitations? And once we identify those things and we figure out, okay, these are these are ways that we're we're kind of building and growing, but these are our challenges. And we can address those when we go into the transitional period. We can say, hey, you know, uh, the Jones Act is really stifling our economic growth. We want the Jones Act lifted during this transitional period so that we can kind of predict what our economy will be like when we're in a and when we're in a system that is free of the Jones Act. Right, right. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of different things that we can do. I mean, even with, uh, like, defense, for example, uh, one of the things that we have to look at here now is that, you know, one of the biggest fears is, oh, if we become, you know, uh, freely associated or independent and we're not a state, then what does that mean for our defense and, and the United States defending our borders? I'll tell you what, Mel, I've been to a lot of countries that are independent and, and they have bases, yeah. military bases. right. You know. The Philippines was a great example of this, right? Because even when the when the they had plans to to transition into an independent country, one of the things that didn't happen was that they didn't dissolve the base, right? They didn't get rid of the base, and that was also one of the criticisms of those negotiations was that the the U.S. kind of had one foot in and one foot out. You know, it's like okay, yeah, we're gonna get out of here, but we're gonna keep this base and we'll save it for later. Right. You know, and so and that kind of that in a, some people kind of criticize that as that part of the negotiations in that, you know, it wasn't a true uh, equitable relationship in that sense because the United States didn't really honor the entire, the agreement to its totality. But that's something that I think we have to take into account, right? We something know, to look out for. Yeah. Something but, to expect. Right. And we right. know that the investment in Guam on a military level is very high. And so I think we can anticipate that once when we move into these negotiations, we should already know that the, the bases and the U.S. military presence is going to be a big part of that conversation. And how do we navigate that? We have to know already that, you know, the investment is very high. 
and the chances of us saying, oh, you're, you're just going to pull out and just leave, I, I think are very low. And so if that's the case, then what, what needs to happen on a local level that makes us feel comfortable with us being able to transition into a new status? You know, how can we make the military presence compatible with our economic and social development in a way that it isn't now? And I think it's clear that there are ways that it impedes that progress now, but you know, we're not in a position to say, hey, we don't like the way that you're doing things here, we wanna change it. Right. And so, you know, when we think about, I, I, that's... I mean, just something simple as, like, we, and I, I talk about this all the time with my friends, it's something as simple as, like, the concept so foreign to people of, you know, renting these bases or, mm -hmm. or leasing these bases. I mean, think about the real estate value of one-third of the island. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and they talk about, like, oh, we get $500 million from the feds. Well, I think that one-third of the island is worth more. Oh, I agree. I agree. Million. I mean, the, the there's a number out there that says that the... United States spends upward of ten, uh, ten billion dollars a year in rent for uh, bases in right. foreign countries, and that doesn't obviously doesn't include Guam. Obvious. Because I mean, we, when we think about Guam, we're not we have to think about Guam in more than just the square miles of land that that bases sit on. We also got to think about the nautical miles that surround Guam. I mean, if you think about the Merc, the Mic Micronesia. Island range complex, the training range, you know, the, right, the right, nautical right. training range. Right. The thing is bigger than the state of Texas. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it, I mean, and that has value. Even the water has value. I mean, the there's countries all over the Australia, Japan are trying to get in on naval exercises right now. Spain is trying to get in on naval exercises right now. You know, and so the Navy has this huge presence in Guam. I, big Navy is Good said point. to. I, didn't, I was just thinking about the land. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's, I mean, I think that there's value. I, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a, there's a ton of value, like you said, in not just the land, but the military investment. Right, right. The right. investment in the island, the historical investment. And I think what's different than in World War II when the United States decided to just kind of pull out when they heard that, you know, Japan was invading. Uh, th this is a totally different dynamic and a totally different era, you know. You I honestly think that that would never happen. Oh, it would never yeah. happen. Yes. In, in today's in today's geopolitical thermophile <laughs> yeah it would never it, that 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 is an impossibility yeah. and, and I, I think if you start from there i mean and i talk about this with my friends too all the time i just don't believe the u.s is uh, they're not going to go i mean even if somehow we picked independence or free right. association i think that you know they've proven that guam is uh you know so strategically important and they yield this island, I mean, it just falls to China, and there's no right. way that that's ever gonna happen. Right, I think that the- So I think we start from there, then there goes all the fear. There's so right. much fear that centers around like, oh, the US is gonna pick up and leave. And right, and I think that that's a good way to look at it, is, you know, starting from that place, starting from that place where we know already history has shown us that there is an investment in Guam. And, we, and you know, granted, history has also shown us that the investment is more so in Guam than the people of Guam. Right, right. But the reality is, is that we're here. We're here and there, you know, we, we uh, get used to it. <laughs> you, you know, we're not going anywhere. It's not, yeah. you know, there's, there's almost 200,000 people on this island. And so, you know, it's not, it's not like we can just, we're, we're easily swept under the rug. You know, we're, we're on the political consciousness of a lot of people in the world, not just in America. Right. Let's talk about uh, Palau. So we talked about the Philippines and their transition. Um, Palau also has some um, interesting things, right? Yeah, there was this really interesting report uh, from the Government Accountability Office that talked about, um, you know, just some of the challenges with Palau uh, as they moved into this freely associated relationship. And some of the things that they cited were uh, uh, weaknesses uh, in areas of procurement, property management, government housing, federal grant monitoring and administration, Revenue and receivable collections, cash management, outstanding encumbrances. Sounds really similar to some of the things that we've been dealing with here in Guam, right? And the reason why I bring this up is because they are familiar issues and they are things that we, that we should already be able to anticipate will be challenges moving forward. I mean, they're challenges right now. Yeah. All of these things pl that plague Palau in their transition currently plague us. And we and we we don't have the same political status that they do. I want to interrupt you. I just want to say, look up Palau now. Right. Right. Yeah. I think right. Palau is one of the shining examples. Absolutely. In our region. And so this is a and that's a that that was where I was trying to go with this is right. that sorry Palau, no no, no absolutely you're you're absolutely right you know is that Palau struggled in the beginning it's no secret you know and Palau 
obviously there are still places where Palau struggles, but Palau has really made great strides since this report was released. And, you know, and a lot of it is just kind of, you know, these guys had to figure it out. They had right. to figure out, they yeah. know, okay, we're here now and we, we know what we want to do. We know where we want to be. We know what the challenges are and we have to invest and we have to fix it. And, they're, and it's not perfect by any stretch. But I would also argue that if, if Palau had anticipated some of these things prior to that transition, it probably would have been a lot smoother. Which is and so, so we're now going to anticipate right. these things. Right? And that's the beauty, I think, of our position. Is as, as tragic as it is that we're so late in the game. Silver lining, Mel. Yes, yeah, silver lining. I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying this positive. Right, you know, yeah, this, uh, yeah. Hey, we're the last ones in the world to decolonize, but guess what? We've been taking notes. Yeah. And uh, optimism is a little tough on me. Yeah, this always okay. feels a little new uncomfortable. New year, new Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're trying it out. Yeah, but I think that that's the you know that that's one of I I agree with you that Palau is one of those examples that that I looked at as a young person and right. thought to myself, wow, why can't we do this in Guam? This seems to really work well in this really small community, mm. and we have a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the potential to build something like this and possibly even make it bigger and better. You know, and, and it, all, it always baffled me why we couldn't do these things. And it wasn't until I started to learn about the challenges of our political status that I started to understand these issues and why, you know, we have these challenges. And so when I look at Palau now with a more critical lens, you know, really looking at what, what were their challenges, because it wasn't right. just this great shining example of free association that we all know it to be in the beginning, right? I mean, people in Palau really struggled, and we can see that here on Guam. I mean, there's a huge Palauan... Uh, uh, population on Guam that has just dug roots in and, and made this place their home and a lot of that is comes from the struggles that they were they facing left, back right, home right, absolutely yeah, yeah. and so you know and that's also a big part of uh, a country's uh, economy is remittances it's something I think that a lot of Philippines huge, yeah right. a lot of Pacific Islander people kind of take that for granted about how big that industry is I mean you're right the the, the Philippines like popularize the the black bayan box you know what i mean think about that think about how many we how do many, it too though yeah. Man. yeah and we all know that word yeah. right we all yeah because it's it's a very real practice and i think that's something that we all have to recognize is that you know when we when we move and shift into a different economy we have to anticipate that there is still a very thriving economy that exists because of our connection with our diaspora and that's not going to change you know, I think that that's that's something that we can. That's one of those industries that we can really. We count just on. sprinkled a little shine on the diaspora. Send twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that right. that's also something that we can think about in our transition. You know, is how do we increase or how do we smooth out our connection with our diaspora? I mean, if you think about like, for example, Guam and the Philippines, right? Because we have this different, di uh, this very differing political status, it definitely creates some challenges for families to. Kind of connect and exchange you know whereas if we if we are already a money that, though yeah absolutely yeah. and so you know but we we find ways no matter what the challenges are we find ways to stay to remain connected with our families i think that that's something that won't change but for us you know i i think that as we move forward the important thing is that we have to really start looking around the region and looking around the world and trying to figure out you know what are some things that work you know like for example uh I know the independence camp really likes to use uh, Singapore as an economic example because they're very similar to Guam in the, uh, the size of the island. The major difference, I would say, is the population. There's way more people in Singapore than right. there are in Guam. And I think also the location. And, I mean, well, we have benefits that they don't. Right, and, but their primary uh, bread and butter is international banking. Right. Right, and, but inter and, you know, international banking is a great industry however it also comes with a lot of challenges right uh, singapore has a lot of issues with money laundering mm. with corruption with drug trafficking which is something that we have to anticipate you know so that's something that i think we is great for us is that we know that we have the infrastructure we we are in a really great location to create an international banking market but we also have to ask ourselves and palau i think knows something a little bit of something about uh, money laundering, you know, and they're in the beginnings of their transition, right? That was one of the challenges that they had to face is how do we deal with, you know, now that we have this political status, we become like this money right. shelter, right? Right. And so, and, and obviously they didn't want that kind of action in their backyard. And so for us, you know, I think that that's the great thing is that we can anticipate those models, right? right? We can anticipate those challenges and figure out, okay, what are we going to put in place in the way of programs and policy that are going to help curb that activity? 
And that's something that I think that people need to be very aware of is that we will do all of this in collaboration and cooperation with the federal government. Right. Because ultimately, I would imagine that the feds, the feds need us to succeed. As much as it, it, I, I say that the tide has changed and that the, even the federal government has realized that they cannot, we, they cannot continue with us as an unincorporated territory forever. As beneficial as this relationship has been to them, they know that it can't Something's continue. Something's got to give. Right. And right. so if it's going to give, they want to. They want the best case scenario. If it's going like to give, they give. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they want. If they're going to give, they want to get back. Right. Yeah. And so what's good I, in th in that case, I think that the more successful, the more prosperous that Guam becomes, the better it is for the federal government. You know, they they need to maintain their geopolitical positioning in the Asia Pacific. You know, how better to do that than with cooperation with Guam? Right. And so, you know, either way, whatever status we choose, I would imagine that the United States will do what they have historically done, which is defend their interests. And, it, and their interests are not compatible with economic, you know, destabilization in the region. It's not compatible with war. You know, they, they don't want that kind of conflict here. I mean, they're already invested in a conflict in the Middle right, East. You right, know? Yeah. I would argue that the United States can't afford another war. Well, there you go. Hey, we're going to give you some uh, homework uh, this week. You know, uh, we talk about it, but God, don't take Mel's word for it. Don't take mine. Go out there and do your research. I'm pretty sure it's, you know, first to second page Google. Yeah. Right? To find it's out not how that difficult to find, <laughs> actually. <laughs> to find out how these um, other uh, countries and nations transitioned from, um, you know, and God, there's no shortage of uh, historical colonies that you can so right. yeah, just check it out and you know kind of uh, familiarize yourself and then discuss it with people because there's just a lot of uh, fear and um, you know lack of knowledge out there about the, the whole process so uh, Mel again um, thank you thank always you. fun to discuss decolonization this has been a group chat my name is uh, Chris Barnett Estajos. yes